Hello everyone, my name is Julian Pollack and I'm going to be delivering our masterclass from the School of Project Management about personalized team building and how we can improve project outcomes. First, I'd like to uh, tell you just a little bit about the school and the university. So the University of Sydney is a great place to study. Um, it is ranked incredibly highly. Uh, we are first in Australia and fourth in the world for graduate employability, which suggests that we're turning out really good quality uh, graduates, second in Australia for innovation. I'm not going to read out all of these, but I'm sure you can get the picture. In the context of project management specifically, we're also incredibly highly performing. University of Sydney is not just a teaching uh, institution, it's also a research institution. And the University of Sydney in a recent uh, study in the Australian Financial Review was ranked as first in Australia and 12th in the world for research into project management. Now what this means is that we are giving you leading new knowledge. We are giving you the cutting edge information on what's going on in the field. Degrees uh, that we offer in project management are also recognized internationally. So the Master of Project Management is accredited by the Project Management Institute's Global Accreditation Center. We're also endorsed by the Australian Institute of Project Management. Now, what, what does this really mean for you? It means that uh, the degrees that we offer you are recognized uh, internationally and locally as very high quality. So both of these organizations provide independent verification of that. Also makes the degrees a little more transferable than you might get in some other places. We offer a variety of different postgrad and undergraduate study options. So for instance, the master, we have the Master of Project Management, which was pre-experience, pre and then two shorter master's level degrees, both of which require work experience. We also have a Bachelor of Project Management. We offer executive education, and we also have continuing education and short courses. So we've got, we've got the lot, and with more than a thousand students in our program, we have a lot of opportunity to both personalize and customize what we're doing for different uh, study groups. So now that you've heard me tell you a little bit about the program, I'd like to tell you about some recent research that we did at uh, the School of Project Management and give you a little bit of a taste about how research feeds into what we teach at the university. Now this will be focusing on improving project performance through personalized team development. Now, before we get into what actually happened in this research, I need to give you a little bit of theory so you understand the context. So, one of the things that we face in a project environment is you've often got a lot of people coming together. They're expected to work really hard, deliver on um, sometimes a new, strange, challenging piece of work. And these people might not have worked together previously. They might not have ever met each other before the project. That's quite common in a project context where you'll have contractors coming together um, and bring, you're bringing specialist skills together. In some environments, you do get the same project team working again and again on a repeated series of projects. But in many cases, that doesn't happen. Now, this is problematic. It's problematic for projects more than uh, continuing operations because things like trust, interpersonal closeness and psychological safety, all of these things take time to develop naturally. It's not like you walk into a room and suddenly, you know, click your fingers. Yes, I trust everyone here. No, you don't know them. Um, you might be able to work with people that you don't know, but you don't feel open. You don't have that same sense of trust and belonging and comfort in expressing silly opinions uh, that you'd get from having long exposure with people. Now, the problem with this is that communication then doesn't tend to be as effective. Now, 
in projects because we're often working under such a tight time frame I and mean, projects tend to get managed to what's referred to as the triple constraint of the time cost quality iron triangle there tends to be an immense pressure on projects to deliver faster or let's say you've been bidding on a project and you've won the project work you might have and you might have you know, given a really tight estimate on how long you think the project will take. Um, take. So you're promising to deliver it quickly, but projects are strange. They're unexpected ever, um, endeavors. They're full of uncertainty. What this means is problems crop up. Things tend to take longer than we estimate. So there's a real imperative, knowing that there's probably gonna be delays somewhere down the track there's a real need to start working well quickly. Now we don't have time in projects to wait for a couple of years for trust, interpersonal closeness, psychological safety to develop naturally. That can take years. So this research was all about finding out whether there's a way to accelerate this process. Can we do it faster? We need to do it faster because we need open and clear communication. If you're in an environment in a project where uh, there's a blame culture or people are not feeling psychologically safe or they're concerned about speaking up when they see a risk, then the project as a whole is going to be less likely to be able to respond effectively. In that kind of environment, what you tend to get is instead risks being pushed under the carpet. Now, don't worry about it. It'll go away. The problem will go away. Well, problems do sometimes go away by themselves, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they get bigger. Sometimes because you didn't speak up early enough, uh, the project, the, the pro what was once a small problem becomes a huge problem for the project. So we really want this sense of psychological safety. So people, can speak up uh, when small things happen, when they make a small mistake and then they don't fear censure. So let's talk about communication generally. So to understand how we're going to improve communication, we need to start with a good understanding of what communication is, how it works. So PMBOK, if you don't know, uh, PMBOK is the project management Institute's Guide on Project Management. It stands for the Guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge. The Project Management Institute uh, is the largest professional association in project management and they produce the PMBOK Guide. Um, it's not very exciting reading, um, but it, it, is, it, it does have a huge influence over the field. So let's look at what Pimbock says about communication. They say that communication includes the processes required to ensure the timely and appropriate generation, collection, dissemination, storage, and ultimate disposal of information. Now, I'd ask you while you're looking at this to take a critical view of um, what's being said here. Take a moment to look at that statement and what does it imply? What does it tell you about Pimbox's worldview about communication? Well, it tells me that they, they focus on process. And Pimbox is a very process focused document. And it's about documents. Uh, there's a lot of focus on you know, you're collecting the information, you're spreading it, you're storing it. All of this is stuff that you do about documents. It's not really talking about the human interpersonal communication aspects, is it? So one of the difficulties is that PMI doesn't provide much more advice on communication. Instead, it refers you to uh, the general management uh, texts on communication. So it, it kind of defers off. But this is a problem for me because communication uh, as a project manager is absolutely essential. Now I've worked in, as a project manager in a variety of different fields. Uh, I started off working in IT project management where there are organizational change components and I was doing that in the public sector. 
and then I went on and worked as a telecommunications project manager. And then after that, I went and worked in uh, rail manufacturing. And then I um, moved on to another position uh, in, in the same company and still in the rail manufacturing context as a program office manager where I had an international supply chain and you know, multi-billion dollar contracts. And we had organization, you know, making new parts of the organization, IT, building, manufacturing, all going on at once. And I can tell you that communication is at the absolute heart of being an effective project manager. Because if you think you're, you're the central point drawing together information from design or engineering, from testing, from procurement, you're talking to the client who has focused on the contract, you're talking to your subcontractors uh, who, are, who you've on, contracted to deliver pieces of work for you. Um, you might be talking to the media, you're talking to your own management who are you know, questioning why, why you've got a red traffic light on something. You're talking to your CEO who wants to know how much risk they've been exposed to. All of these people um, have different communication needs. Being a good project manager is like being a translator um, because you have to be able to converse with all these different stakeholders in ways that they can understand. It's always, the obligation is always on you to make sure that you are understood well. So if there is one piece of, if there is one skill that I advise you to become excellent at as a project manager, it's communicating well. So when I read that P um, Pimbok recommends you go and look elsewhere, I, I think we need to do a little better. So let's go on. Let's look at more of Pimbox view of communications. So this is how they represent uh, the communication management activity. And again, you can see looking critically, um, we have a process focused uh, view of the world, almost a systems view of the world where there is an input, it is being processed through tools and techniques, and then there is an output. And again, you will see that most of the focus here is on the planning documentation that's being produced. What we also see is uh, this, this model, which appears in uh, PIMBOK. Now, this is based on information theory. It's a very basic model of communication, uh, which splits communication into three broad groups. There's simplex, which is one-way communication, kind of like we've got right now where I'm giving information to you. There is half duplex, uh, where information goes both ways, but only one way at a time. And then there's full duplex, which is kind of information going everywhere at once. But with all of these, we've got a basic model where we have a sender who wants to push out some information. Now they take the information and they encode it in some way. They then transmit the message using some method. There might be noise. Noise doesn't necessarily mean auditory noise. It can just mean that there's disruption in the signal. And then there's the receiver who takes that noisy message and decodes it. Now, in the context of what we've got now, I have thoughts in my brain about what I want to say. I am encoding them as sound, which comes out. I'm transmitting the message to you via sound, which there are a few intermediary factors like zoom in the middle. Noise could be my daughter knocking on um, the door. Uh, it could be uh, one of your friends um, phoning you just as I'm talking and you're being distracted for a moment. It might just be a bad communication line. So you might lose some of the message for some reason or another. And then you take what you've got out of the message and you try and decode it. So you take the sound that you've heard and you turn that into your thoughts. All of which um, is filtered through things like how you're feeling at the time. Now this, this is an okay model of communication, but it's a pretty basic communication model. And frankly, I feel like there's a lot more going on in comms all the time. Communication is an incredibly complex activity. 
I like this model here. Um, this is a lot messier. This model is from a book by Checkland and Holwell called Information Systems and Information Systems. Um, and it's, they call it the Processes for Organization Meanings Model. There's a lot going on here, but it captures a lot more of the actual process of communication, meaning generation, and how that turns into action. Now, there are numbers, and I'll use the numbers on the elements as a way of talking through this, but don't think of this as a step-by-step -step process. All of this is happening simultaneously. So we've got one, we've got our individuals and groups. These are people or groups of people. If it's a group of people, it's gonna be a group of people that see the world in a comparable way. Uh, it might be you and your friends, it might be your family, it might be the people you work with on a daily basis, or it might be an individual. And these individuals or groups see the world, that's number two, the perceived world. Now we're not talking about an objective reality here, we're talking about the bits of the world that you see. Because frankly, the bits that you don't uh, experience in one way or another don't tend to have a great deal of impact on what you're doing. Now, I'm not saying you're only affected by direct engagement. Of course, you're affected by uh, information that you get through other media like TV, the newspaper. That, that to me counts as directly engaging with because you're perceiving that newspaper article, for instance. But what you perceive at any one time is effect, affected by your worldview, your appreciative settings. Uh, if you've just bought a Volkswagen, suddenly you see Volkswagens everywhere. Now it's not that there are any more Volkswagens on the road, it's just that you're now, your, your worldview has been changed, you've been sensitized towards seeing them. Um, you might have just stubbed your toe really badly on a rock. That changes your worldview. Suddenly it's much more negative. You've, you're seeing the world through a pain filter. You're more likely to interpret things in a, a negative way. You know, your, your true love has just expressed their deep, feeling, their deep reciprocal feelings for you. The world is glowing. Everything changes again. Your, your, the way you perceive the world changes. So we have individuals and groups, all of whom are seeing the world based on what they are sensitized to see at that time. And they engage in discourse. So they, they share their experiences of the world, which creates these shared meanings. So created meanings are, are, um, come out of this discourse. Now that comes from a couple of different levels. We've got a basic level data, information, which is data that we've selected, um, and then knowledge, which is information, which is in a real, in a context that has some significance for us. So through the creation of meanings, we as groups come together to decide on what we're going to do. We create assemblies of related intentions and accommodations. So intentions, our ideas about what we are going to do either as individuals or as groups and accommodations. We knock the edges off our, the, our meanings so they can fit together with other people's. We make them compatible with the group. This leads to action, which changes the world and changes what we see in the world. And all of these processes are filtered to a certain extent through this box seven uh, which is generally the information systems which exist in our environment. And we're not just talking about IT, computer systems, Zoom, which allows you to hear my voice and see me from you know, shoulders up. Um, that, that is one form of information system, but also um, we could be talking about the things I can easily express on a form that I fill in or um, the patterns of communication that um, we fall into as habits as part of our social structure. So this, all of this is going on at once. And if you try and picture all of these things happening simultaneously, you get an idea about how complex, messy, dynamic communication really is. Now think of this 
not just on the scale of you and a few friends or you and your team at work. Think of it on the scale of an organization of a hundred people where this, there is this ongoing soup of discourse and meaning creation, which is happening all the time or expand that to an organization of a thousand. It is very, very hard to have a good picture of what's going on at any one time. But this very richness makes it fascinating. So I want to tell you about a piece of research that we did uh, that was looking at how we could actually improve communication in a real organization with real people. So uh, this research was published last year, uh, towards the end of last year in the International Journal of Project Management, which is the top journal uh, in this field. And it's work that I did with a colleague, Petr Matus. Uh, it was also, uh, that was the, the previous slide was the academic journal. Um, you can find it through uh, academic libraries. Um, more people read it uh, when we wrote it up as a newspaper article. So uh, we wrote it as uh, an article which was republished uh, by a lot of different news networks, particularly across Australia and Asia and into the UK, um, and was read more than 200,000 times, which we were quite happy with. But what did we actually do? So let me tell you a story about two teams coming together. Imagine um, a group of people who uh, essentially a project management resource pool. We had two project management resource pools and they'd been working on similar kinds of work, you know, very comparable kinds of projects. And the organization had decided that it was sensible to bring these two teams together to make one larger pool of people. That way, when things were quiet in one group of projects, people could be shifted over and working on another group of projects. In theory, it was a very uh, sensible idea. It would, should have led to a lot more uh, efficiency in resource allocation. So we had two project management teams that have been brought together, but they just weren't playing nicely together. Um, so they, the, none of the efficiencies that the organization hoped for had actually been realized. All they were seeing as two teams that were really quite resentful and really not happy with the situation at all. What we were asked was, could we help with creating a greater sense of trust and collaboration between the teams? Could we effectively take them from a situation where they were two separate teams and turn them into one team instead. So the question is, how do you bring teams together? The standard approach would be to go for something like team building an approach to team building. Now, if you think, if you think about different team building uh, techniques, what they tend to do is they'll bring everyone off and they will, they'll, they'll take them out of the workplace and you'll do something different and fun and maybe challenging. You might, for instance, go whitewater rafting. You might go mountain biking. You might go on a cooking class. Um, you might do something like, uh, so for instance, I, I recently went on a kind of cultural competence uh, piece of team building where we learned about, um, me and my team learned about uh, Australian Aboriginal culture, which was a good thing for the team to do together. But we question whether these, these shared experience style activities actually do a great deal to bring the team together. So if I think about my cultural competence uh, trip, it was great, I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot about Aboriginal culture but I'm not convinced it actually did much in terms of team building. And I'll tell you why. Think about what would happen like this, or think about, you can even go back to, uh, think back to high school. Um, think about a, um, a school trip that you might've gone on. 
Who did you spend time with on the school trip? Did you spend time with the people who you didn't like? Did you spend time with the people who you didn't really know and didn't have much of a relationship with? Or did you spend time with the people who you already knew and liked? I would say that for most people, they would have spent almost all of their time, as much time as they could, with their friends. It's only natural. They're our friends because we like spending time with them. So if there's an opportunity to spend time with your friends or people you're not friends with, you're more likely to gravitate towards spending time with your friends. So think about a work-based team building exercise. You, know, you get the team of 30 people, you send them all off for a cooking class. Well, they're all going to just gravitate towards the people they already have a good relationship with. That doesn't necessarily help team building. What you want in team building is to improve the negative or non-existent relationships. So we wanted a team building technique that would allow us to do that. We thought there's diminishing returns from trying to take an already good relationship and make it great, but there's possibly a huge amount of return taking a non-existent relationship and making it good. We thought that would be much easier. So what did we do? We're doing research. So we took three basic steps. The first step was understanding the situation. So what we did is we did a survey to understand team communication. Now this did a couple of things for us. It allowed us to personalize the team building activity to the team. And it allowed us to establish a baseline. So we understood what the current situation was. Our next activity was we wanted to improve the situation. So we intervened in the situation and we um, ran a pair based structured conversation with people. I'll tell you what this is in a minute. And then step three, we measured the impact. So we came back a while later to test whether what we'd done had made any difference. After all, we're not just trying to sell services. We want to actually see whether we made a difference to the situation. So let me talk through each of these steps in a bit more detail. Step one, what we did was we interviewed everyone on in the teams. That's terrible grammar. We interviewed everyone in the teams. And what we used was an approach called social network analysis. Social network analysis is a way of understanding communication and interaction patterns. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. But one thing that was interesting is that there was quite a bit of hostility in the environment. So what we, what the manager of the situation had told us was that, uh, she was much more friendly with one of the groups that had come together than the, than the other. And when we went into the situation and started talking to the staff, we realized that they were not happy in the situation. They were only really resorting to quite negative forms of communication. They were negative towards us. They were negative towards their manager. They were negative towards their colleagues. It was oh, really quite a tense environment, a bit unpleasant. So actually, let's just go. Uh, oh, no. So what we did is we interviewed everyone. And I'll tell you a bit about what the interview questions were. And then I'll tell you about what that allowed us to do. So participants were uh, asked the following questions. Imagine you're in a situation where you had to discuss a personal issue with this person. How comfortable would you feel? So imagine you're in a situation and we, um, and we are asking you this question. I would ask you this question. Uh, let's say there are 20 people in the team, 20 times about every single person in the team. And we asked them to rate their level of comfort, talking to John, talking to Jill, talking to Jack, talking to Jane, talking to Julian. Um, I can't think of any more J names. 
uh, and then we'd go on to the next question. So someone would write everyone against this first question and then we'd go on to the second question. How frequently do you talk about personal issues with this person? Then we ask questions about work. Imagine you made a significant mistake at work. How comfortable would you feel initiating a discussion with it about it with this person? And then how frequently do you talk about work related issues with this person? So we've got four questions. Uh, two of them are about personal communication. Two of them are about work. Two of them are about how frequently people talk together and two of them are about comfort talking together. Next, what we did in the interviews was we told them what would be happening next. We told them that we would be pairing them up with another person and they would go through a structured conversation which was designed um, to help build relationships. And we asked them, you know, is there anyone you would either like to do this with or not want to do this with. We also explained to them that this was an opportunity for them to build a relationship with someone they didn't yet have a relationship with in the team. We explained to them that it would be a bit pointless doing this with someone you already have a good relationship with, but you need to be comfortable enough um, with the person that you can um, talk to them freely. So we asked them, is there anyone you do want to or don't want to do the pair based conversation with? And that was very important because we needed to make sure that people were comfortable and we also didn't want to force people into um, difficult situations or compromising situations. So what did these first four questions allow us to do? They allowed us to construct four social networks, four social network diagrams, also called a sociogram. Um, this is an example of one of them. Now it's not the full network. If you can imagine, um, let's take the personal communication comfort. How comfortable are you talking about personal issues with the other person? Everyone rated everyone else. So if I was to show you the full network, there would be a line from every single person to every other person. Visually, that's almost impossible to read. Um, most of the analysis is done, uh, not visually, it's done um, using statistical software. But to actually be able to visually understand it, we removed a lot of the links. We only kept the links that uh, had that showed the strongest relationships. Now I've changed all the names. If anyone's really paying attention, um, you might notice that all of them are the names of Bond villains in this case. Um, and what you can see here is that there are clearly two different groups, aren't there? There's a blue group and a red group. Now we've only colored them blue and red um, later on in the analysis to help show this more clearly, but it's obvious that there's two separate parts to this organization, two cliques. And what we did is we changed all the names, we de-identified everything and we, we, and we showed the manager and she said, oh yes, yes, exactly, two separate groups. And uh, that, was, that was nice validation, but it also gave us the grounds of working out um, who we should pair with whom, because we didn't want two groups, we wanted to bring these groups together. So we, we chose people to pair together. We paired people based on three priorities. The first one was initial minimum link weights. So what I mean by that is I've rated let's say I've rated Joe lowly in terms of how often we talk together and Joe has rated me lowly and saying, so we're both agreeing that we don't talk together very often. Now we focused, our hypothesis was, would the, was that the greatest impact would be on personal communication comfort. So we chose that as the initial minimum link weight to focus on. Then there was the people's expressed preference. So who they did and didn't want to be paired with. Uh, 
Now we couldn't respect everyone's choices about who they did want to be paired with, but we made sure that we respected everyone's choice about who they didn't want to be paired with. So no one was paired with anyone who either had said they didn't want to be paired with. And we also got feedback from their manager. So we asked the manager, is there anyone who we shouldn't be pairing together? Uh, and got general feedback on that, which was really useful um, because we didn't know the people particularly well. Um, and there was one case where we had paired two people together, not knowing them. And without seeing our pairings, the manager said, oh, you probably shouldn't put this person, this person together because of some history between them. So that was useful because it's important to make this as, as positive an experience as possible for people. So coming back to this network image, when we'd uh, decided who we're pairing, we've got links which are more like this. So these were the people that we were trying to pair together. And you can see that we are trying, our aim here is to knit everything together as one group. Okay, so that was our intention. What did we actually do with these people? How did we help them come to a position where they had a stronger relationship? Well, we used a pair-based structured conversation uh, and we wanted to use something which had been previously verified as effective. So we found uh, an exercise which had been developed in the psychological literature by Aaron and many co-authors called the experimental generation of interpersonal closeness, a procedure and some preliminary findings. Not a very catchy title, but in this uh, procedure that Aaron and colleagues uh, describe um, is a series of 36 questions. Now what they did is they ran an experiment many, many times where they brought people together and they led them through a structured set of 36 questions. And then they measured how much they liked the person before and after the exercise. They got those results and then they found, developed another set of 36 questions and these weren't, uh, these were just general small talk questions, questions along the lines of, you know, what did you do on the weekend? What's your favorite sports team? What's the most recent uh, movie that you've been to? Kind of general small talk questions. What kind of weather do you like? And they compared this first set of 36 questions with the small talk questions and they found there was a statistically significant difference. So we've got 36 questions which have been experimentally shown to lead to greater interpersonal closeness. This has also been represented, uh, this is a, these questions have appeared in the popular media a few times, for instance, uh, in the New York Times, they were written about as the 36 questions that lead to love. Uh, I think they've also been featured on the Big Bang Theory. Now, these aren't really questions that lead to love. Um, they're questions that give you a greater sense of understanding of who the other person is as a person, which we thought um, would potentially lead to greater comfort discussing work-related issues. The questions are quite interesting um, and you can look them up quite easily. Uh, you could type the 36 questions that lead to love into Google and, and it would, you'd find it very quickly. The three sets of questions start off relatively um, comfortably, but they rapidly get more and more personal until you're answering really very personal questions um, and, and sharing very personal things with, with the other person. Um, I've, I've done this a couple of times. Um, we've also, my team at uh, the university went through a merger process and we used exactly the same process on ourselves. And uh, it was really fascinating because uh, I went through the exercise with someone from the other team uh, that I was going to be working with who I didn't really know. And within only an hour conversation, I'm discussing really very personal things with this person that I didn't know. And afterwards there was, there was a persistent lingering feeling of I'm more comfortable talking to this person. 
So this is the exercise that we used. Here are some examples of questions that were um, used getting to know the other person. So for instance, they start off with, given the choice of anyone in the world, whom would you have as a dinner guest? Not too difficult. Halfway through, they're becoming more personal. Things like, what do you value most in a friendship? A kind of question where you actually need to stop and think. By the end of the hour, they're very personal. Share with your partner in an embarrassing moment in your life. Or what if anything is too serious to be joked about? You know, things that cut to core values. So how did we actually do this? Uh, we brought people, once they'd been matched together, um, into a separate room. Oh, it looks like I have the same slide. Uh, and we would give them the first set of uh, 12 questions. And we told them, tell them to take turns answering the questions and that we would uh, come in in 15 minutes. So we left them away from their workplace. So we put them onto a different floor of their building where they wouldn't have people spying and wondering what was going on. And they would talk through those 12 questions over the first 15 minutes. No one finishes all the questions and that's just fine. And then um, our facilitator would come in and give them the next set of uh, 12 questions, go on for another 15 minutes. And then we'd give them the third set of questions. Oh. What was really interesting um, is that a lot of the teams, when, you know, we, um, when we come in at the 45 minute mark, a lot of the pairs would say, oh, can we keep going? Um, so quite a few wanted to keep going. We'd come in at the hour mark and say, you know, the, you've been in there for an hour. Some of them kept going. Um, in some cases, the meeting rooms were booked directly afterwards and they went off and uh, kept talking in the coffee lounge or something like that. So what actually happened? Did our intervention do anything? Yes, it did. So this is an example of what changed. We've got the networks before and after. This is a different representation of uh, the network to what I showed you previously, but you can see significant change in um, network B with a lot more, um, a lot more links. So again, what I'm only showing you here is the links that were rated a 10 out of 10. Um, so you can see suddenly a lot more people are rating each other 10 out of 10 in terms of comfort, uh, which is a huge, uh, huge difference. You might look at this and think, well, but one of the links is not there that was previously. Um, what's going on there is there's very little um, uh, difference between rating someone a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. So we're seeing in, generally in this case, people dropping from 10 out of 10 to nine out of 10, which really doesn't make much of a difference in terms of the relationship. What's important here is we've got a lot more high scores. So we wanted to know not just how does the network look differently. We wanted to actually measure where the, whether there was a difference. So what we did is we compared the change over the three months from the first survey to the last survey. Um, and we compared the intervention pairs to the non-intervention pairs. So in other words, we compared the relationships between people that went through the pair-based exercise together to their relationship with everyone else. What we wanted to know is had our intervention accelerated the change in um, their relationships. We're assuming that the relationship will develop over time naturally because trust, psychological safety do develop over time naturally. But did we speed up the process? And the answer is yes, we did quite a lot. So for personal comfort, you can see there's a comparison of you know, 1.9 compared to 0.07. Um, so for the people who didn't go th through the, or for the relationships that weren't directly affected by the team building, uh, the relationship building exercise, there's almost no change. For the ones that did go through it, there's a huge change. In terms of personal frequency, we also see a very big difference. Now, the impact on work-related comfort and frequency is quite a bit smaller. 
but it is still um, statistically significant and pronounced. So we've got a lot more comfort in terms of, well, we have more comfort in terms of uh, discussing work-related problems and people are talking more frequently. Now, the intervention that we used focused most on getting to know the other person as a human. So it doesn't surprise us very much that the impact on personal comfort and personal uh, personal comfort and personal frequency was most pronounced. But we found it fascinating that that did have still an effect on work-related comfort and frequency. So it is possible to make a significant impact on team communication in a very short time. And what we did really was um, a very, very sh short piece of work in terms of their personal commitment. They went through a one hour conversation uh, with one other person and they filled out two surveys, each of which took 15 minutes. Compare that to the investment in time that you might get uh, going off on a white water, water rafting day, which could be a lot of fun, but might not necessarily affect team building or team communication very effectively. One thing that we found fascinating was that in our exit survey, we asked them whether they enjoyed the exercise. Not everyone did. Not everyone liked it. Um, not everyone was comfortable talking about personal things with uh, someone at work. But what we found fascinating was that whether they enjoyed it or not had absolutely no difference to uh, whether they got benefit out of it in terms of a stronger relationship. So even if when people didn't enjoy the exercise, after the intervention, they still had a stronger relationship with the person they did the exercise with. Now, it also doesn't surprise us too much that not everyone found it a pleasant experience because we're asking people to change and change quite quickly. And change often involves discomfort. Um, I have two small children and they're going through growing pains as their bodies stretch and grow. Change is often painful or uncomfortable. And we're asking people to change their relationship quite quickly over a very short space of time. So that's not too surprising for us. And as I said, regardless of whether they liked it, things still changed. So this has been uh, me telling you about some research that we did on how to improve project performance through personalized team development. It's an example of the kinds of things that we teach in class and the kinds of ways where we are using our research um, that is changing project management and changing international understanding of what good project management practice is uh, to contribute to what we're teaching in class. This is not material that has appeared in any textbook yet because it's only recently been published, but because we're doing research in the field, we can give it to you straight away. Okay, so I'll hand back uh, to Carlos at this point um, to see if there are any questions or if I can answer any of your inquiries. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Julian, for that uh, great presentation. Um, I'm sure we all, all attendees um, were as happy as I to, to hear from you and all, all these changes and everything that is happening. So please everyone type a question in the Q&A so Julian can answer them. Um, Julian, in the meantime, if I can ask you a question, we're talking about, um, um, we're talking about communication and in this, in this era of um, being online, how much has um, working remotely is affecting all these relationships and all these team building? Yeah, it, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I suspect that even though uh, we've been working very well for a while, things are likely to get more complicated. So I've been reading a lot in the newspaper about uh, productivity and efficiency gains, about what we're uh, gaining in terms of not having to commute a lot of the time. Um, now that's great, but 
if you think about who you're communicating with, you know, you, you're, you might be working with your colleagues via something like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or something like that. Um, and that works while we've got those existing strong relationships. But if we're not coming into the office quite as often, then what we're missing out on is those casual encounters, the, the water cooler talks, the surprising bumping into someone that leads to uh, an interesting idea which might change how you're working. So we're missing out on a lot of that. We're also missing out on uh, a lot of our ability to take those nascent, those still forming relationships, uh, those kind of neutral level, I don't really yet have a relationship with the person and take it to that next level where you become comfortable, where you collaborate very effectively. Uh, so I, I am concerned uh, in terms of productivity about what will happen when we have lost the ability or some of the ability to spark up these new relationships, which doesn't work as effectively um, virtually. This is actually one of the um, ways where something like this could become very effective because we can, it's a very simple technique that can be done virtually with teams uh, and can allow us to bring project teams together because we, we don't have the opportunity as much um, for everyone to sit together around a table to eat in the lunch corner at work and talk about their kids. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting time for us uh, as we learn how to build these weak links into stronger links um, using virtual media. It's an interesting time. Yes, Julian, that, that, is, that, is, that is true. We're living in interesting times. <laughs> this decade has really, it's still very, not what we expected. Oh. Um, we have a question from Davies upon here. He's asking, what are the scholarship options for the program? And what is the mode of teaching since the COVID-19 is not over? Okay. Uh, so because COVID um, is not over, uh, we are offering everything online. I mean, this is not actually new. We've been offering everything um, online for quite a while. Uh, in all frankness, um, although uh, I, I sometimes miss going into the office, um, it, COVID hasn't been a massive delivery problem for us in the project management program because uh, almost all of our material has been available to online students uh, before this happened. So. Uh, unlike a lot of places, we didn't have to go through a massive shift. The only thing that uh, is really changed is that a lot of our units don't have uh, a face-to-face -face com component uh, at the moment. We are offering some classes with a face-to-face -face option, but we're finding very few students are electing to come into class. Uh, so everything is available online. You can um, do your whole degree online if you want. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's working quite well. I miss seeing students face to face. Um, I, I enjoy talking in class, but uh, the online delivery is going really well. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, we have a question here from Hint. Is there, would there be another lesson? I'm interested to join such courses. Please let me know if the university will organize another course. I suppose she's referring to this, um, seminar that you're just giving now? Uh, so we do uh, certainly uh, do quite a bit of material on social network analysis. Um, the material that I've just given you um, features in uh, my change management unit um, because it's absolutely essential um, as a change manager to understand the social network that um, a change will be delivered in. And we also offer uh, OLEs, um, sorry, OLEs are short courses. Um, uh, on social network analysis where you could learn more about this. I don't know if we're offering more master classes of this style though. And Carlos, you might be able to answer that instead of me. Yes, well, you know, if you would like to come to university, you can, there's plenty of master degrees within the School of Project Management that you're able to, um, to study. Um, as Julian mentioned, there's always also OLS and um, sometimes free courses are used that you're able to take. Uh, we also have the Center for Continuing Education, where you can also um, take some courses on project management, so you get a taste of, of what it is like. 
Um, we have a question from him, how can I apply? Well, let me answer that one. You can apply through the website. Um, you go to the website, you find the master project management or, in, or any other course within the project management uh, degree. You can do a graduate certificate, diploma, and you can enroll there. And that's how you apply. Um, I have another question. What's the number of hours week required? Estimate if I'm planning to continue working and I want to do this master as part-time. Okay, it's going to vary a little. Um, and our units are delivered in a variety of different formats. We tend to estimate that over the semester, one unit of study, so one six credit points subject, will take you between 120 and 150 hours to complete. You could probably get by on less, but you won't get as much out of it. It's very much like everything else in life. You know, the more of yourself that you put in, the more you're going to get out. Um, so I'd encourage you to uh, dive in and throw yourself at the units and get everything out of them that you can uh, because it doesn't cost you any more or less whether you, you know, do a superficial job or, or do a lot. Um, some of our units are delivered on a weekly delivery basis, um, which might be two hours a week. Um, in the unit I'm delivering right now, I'm doing one hour a week with three longer blocks during the semester. So it's one hour each week and then at three points we have full days. Uh, but again, with what I'm doing, a lot of my material can be um, taken asynchronously. So the vast majority of content in the unit I'm delivering um, can be done at your own pace, uh, at your own time. So it, you can watch the videos and do the readings and do the discussion board work um, at midnight or in a completely different time zone and that works out well. Other units are delivered entirely in intensive mode um, where you might be needing to pay attention for two or three days straight as a block and then you might have another block later in the semester but that's all the face-to-face -face time that you need. So it really varies quite a lot and you can to a large extent pick units uh, to suit your work commitments. There is a reasonable amount of flexibility for that. Thank you very much, Julian. So we have, I suppose, the last two questions from Ishid is asking how project management is different from program management. Okay, um, very, super, very quickly. Um, they take quite different approaches. Uh, although there is a very blurry line between the two, programs tend to be larger uh, tend to be slightly blurry around the edges and might, might focus more on value and benefit rather than tangible outcomes, which projects tend to focus on. But the line between the two uh, is not always very clear. And the last question from Daniel, is the graduate certificate a nice building block, I suppose, into the masters? Oh, sorry, is a, what kind of certificate? Is the graduate certificate a nice building block uh, yeah, certificates are definitely a good starting point. Um, a certificate will be a great way of getting something on your CV if you're looking to get into the discipline. Um, they're usually much faster to achieve, but again, you won't get um, quite the same level of learning. So something from our um, continuing education group is a great way of starting into the program. And that is all for today. Um, thank you very much to Associate Professor Julian Pollack for this masterclass. Please, everyone join me in a virtual round of applause thank for you him, very much. Um, this great lecture. And um, we'll wait for you next semester in any of the programs within the School of Project Management. Thank Hope you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you everyone who came today.